So let's say I handed you a large code base of PHP files, let's say three, 500 files, like massive, and asked you to audit it for bugs. What exactly would you do? What would be your workflow? What would you do to save yourself time? Would you run out and install code sonar and run everything against it? Would you create your own parser? Would you just grep for things? And what things would you grep for? So one of the things that I think that I would do, and one of the things that I had to do recently was to audit a PHP code base. What's interesting about this is I really don't know much about PHP. I know that PHP has a lot of common pitfalls and depending on which version of PHP that you're running, certain things that look like they are, you know, built in safety mechanisms can be bypassed. So it really depends on a lot of different factors on your PHP code base, what version of PHP you're targeting and et cetera, et cetera. But when I did my full code review, I was really just taking the code base, throwing it all into sublime text and going line by line in a bunch of different files that I thought were relevant. And in those, I would mark off things that looked kind of interesting and just keep going. And what I assumed and what I started doing was taking a look at built-in features of PHP that were sanitizing inputs, and I just kind of marked them off as being okay, no way to bypass them. And it's this kind of uh, naive approach that I don't have experience with these particular uh, sanitization functions that I just assumed that they're okay and continued. Eventually I finished my analysis and thought that I should go back and take a look at those uh, sanitization functions and see if they could be bypassed. And in certain cases they can. So I learned a valuable lesson in terms of code auditing and what I should really be looking for. And I thought I'd pose the question to people I work with. Uh, I got a lot of snarky answers and uh, response and reply to, uh, you know, if I gave you a large PHP code base, uh, how would you audit it? I work with a lot of folks who do binary analysis. So most of the time we don't deal with source code. Uh, and even if we do, we're probably dealing on a layer that is something like, you know, C code or C++, not really PHP or ASP.NET or whatever else, right? So what's really kind of interesting about this, this question posing to, to people that I work with is that uh, you get a lot of, I, I think of the same kind of idea, like, well, I'll just take the code, throw it into you know my favorite text editor and just start kind of making notes, randomly moving around. But if I compared that to binary analysis and I, I gave a large set of binaries for somebody to analyze, and if that was their approach, then I, I would try to <laughs> try to encourage them not to take that approach. Let's do some type of attack surface analysis. Let's break down what's actually being handled where and try to like prioritize our code. And that got me thinking a little bit about how exactly do I take that approach and apply it to a different language. So we'll use PHP as an example. And one of the things I came across was a really interesting tool to kind of help me keep things organized. And that was DREC. So let's take a look at it. DREC originally started off as a project called Watchtower, developed by Chris Allen Lane. If you go and take a look at Watchtower, it tells you that it's deprecated and to take a look at DREC. Uh, Watchtower is originally written in uh, Ruby, uh, I think like eight or nine years ago, quite a while ago. And then about four years ago, we had commits to um, DREC, which is uh, using Node. So what's really cool about this is we can just NPM install DREC and we're ready to get to the races, right? He does talk about some signatures that we can run against this and down below there's a DREC signatures repo that has some signatures for different languages, including PHP. Now really uh, on the surface, this is a glorified grep. It just kind of looks through your code base, looking for specific strings and then reports them. But what's really cool is the way that it does it. Let's take a look at what DREC output looks like. So this is DREC. This is the output of a scan that was performed in DREC, which we'll talk about how to do in a little bit. But it shows us the breakdown of all the different signatures that came back. I've named my project for a particular device, and I'll show you where this comes from and why we chose it. Uh, but we have different levels of, of alerts here. Right now, we don't have any of these listed. Everything comes out as unknown. And then we can sort by specific file type that matched, either HTML, JavaScript, or PHP. So for example, I'll start with the PHP tags. It starts working down by different matches that were alerted from the signatures file. So let's say I wanted to look at things that were related to um, you know, command injection. So I might look for eval or exec, uh, something like this. I can jump directly to it and start evaluating these. Well, 
In exec, this one doesn't look like I can actually uh, inject into it, so I'll just put this as OK. I've marked that particular point of interest, or POI, as OK, and later on I can go back and filter by all of my OKs and just you know, take a look or have somebody else reanalyze this. As you click these things, you can also add some notes. And with these notes, they'll get saved to local storage in your browser, so you can pull them back up and take a look at them again. Really, really cool feature. So as we start walking through these and looking at specific issues, we see that looks really interesting. An exec based off a MAC address, I might be able to inject into that. This is where this type of analysis comes in handy, right? So you can't, cannot parse languages with regular expressions because the PHP language is not a regular language. Um, we can go into the Chomsky hierarchy and start talking about the pumping lemma and how you actually parse languages. But the really important thing to note is that we're just matching on keywords. The exact keyword could be a function or it could just be a comment that somebody left in there. We don't actually know the context or the semantics on what that trigger means, but it can get us most of the way. And in a lot of cases, it can get pretty close and it can generate some really interesting POIs. One of the things I think would be really interesting to have in a tool like this, other than dark mode, it's blinding my eyes right now, is a way to be able to click on this and bring us up directly into that. Not only that, like bring you directly to that file in like Sublime Text or uh, Notepad++ or something, but the idea that I can take a look at exec and then uh, have a little text description that tells me why I want to look at this. What are the things that I'm looking for? How could somebody inject into this? Uh, and how could this relate to command injection? What are the types of things that I want to look for? I think one of the interesting things about having uh, code auditing on a team or working in a team to find bugs is that you have people of varying degrees of experience and you might have somebody who has 20 years or like a grizzled veteran of the industry and somebody who just came out of college that person who came just out of college could have experiences that the veteran doesn't have right so just because you have a lot of years in doesn't mean that you're not going to be able you're going to be able to outperform everyone. Everybody has, you know, approaches these problems with a different lens, different set of experiences and biases that make them better suited or, you know, maybe more adapt to, to uh, take on a specific challenge. So in this case, what would be nice to do is when you have lots of people splitting, dividing and conquering and working on this is teaching them by giving a sort of baseline, right? With a tool like this, what we can do is tag or flag all of our different, um, you know, terms that we're looking and we're grappling through with some information that educates the user. And what this do is kind of make sure that everybody is sort of on the same baseline. While we're going through this process, a tool like this to help you not only keep organized and keep track of your points of interest, but also to be able to give a little bit of encouragement or ideas, like brainstorming a little bit of an example to the users, your, your teammates who are using this to try to analyze code, some indication of why you would want to use that, right? So let's go ahead and I'll, I'll mark this as critical, by the way, and kind of show you how to do that. So when we're at the top, um, I can uncheck unknown. Uh, and we'll have nothing here listed. I'll go ahead and check critical, and then I'll see I have my one critical thing here. So I can go back really quickly and add some notes and you know whatever else we need to. I think Drek is awesome. In terms of being able to keep track of everything, it's fantastic. And if you were to ask me prior to finding Drek, would this be a good idea? I would have said no until I saw the interface and actually used it. This is awesome. Um, the reason why I would have said no is because grepping for bugs is not necessarily a great thing to do. The more files that you have, the more false positives you're gonna have, the more POIs you're gonna have. I mean, I've got 1700 to go through here. I guarantee you not all of these are bugs. Uh, a very small fraction of these might be, maybe none of them. So an ideal case is really to have a parser, uh, is really to have an analysis platform that can use that parser and try to make sense of everything and really point you to the, the critical pieces uh, but this can really help you out. So let's say that you're starting this new um, source code audit and you have a bunch of PHP. What I like to do is kind of take a step back and go look at known PHP vulnerabilities to kind of like set my mind straight, right? Put the right hat on and start thinking like a bug hunter who is, you know, seasoned and experienced with PHP. And the way that I like to do that is to go searching for known vulnerabilities. So 
Uh, I pulled up one of my favorite mailing lists here, full disclosure, and just started typing in vulnerability PHP. And I came up with this list. So this was found by the Fermadine team at Carnegie Mellon. Dominic Chen is one of the lead developers over there. Um, and this was from a long time ago. So 2016, it's 2021 right now. And it talks about a lot of Netgear devices that had issues with PHP. So what we can do now is go looking at, if we kind of scan this down, um, it'll tell us what CVE is related to this. I'll go to the CVE on CVE details, um, and it tells us a little bit more information, and it also tells us that there's one Metasploit module available. We go to that Metasploit module on ExploitDB, and now we have some interesting information on how to actually exploit these things. Uh, so looking down a little bit further, uh, it tells us that there is a variables post here. On the MAC address field, it looks like there's a command injection on that field. So this is perfect. This is what I want to look for. This is what I want to kind of like set my mind at. And I want to start looking at as many examples of these as possible. It's sort of like if you gave me a large PHP code base and you said, get to work right now, um, it would be sort of like a batter coming out of the dugout and just running up to the home plate and not being on deck. You know, swing the bat a few times, get the feeling of what's going on, get sort of warmed up, right? So by doing this, it allows us to sort of set our mind sort of at the right <laughs> a viewpoint or vantage point, I guess, to, to, to do this type of auditing. So uh, we found out back from the mailing list um, what devices had issues and sort of a little bit of information from this guy. And down here, it tells us a little bit of applicability. So we can take a look at the one of these devices and the version of firmware. Then we can go to Netgear. If this is a really old device, it's end of life. And if we scroll down a little bit under, you click more firmware and you'll eventually find like the 305. There's a MIB version and a firmware version. We'll just grab the firmware version. So I've already done this. And one of the things I like to do when extracting firmware um, is to just um, use 7-zip. It's the very first thing I always do uh, because 7-zip pretty much extracts everything. And we want to make sure that um, we can extract a file system from these guys. That file system will have the PHP files that we're looking at, hopefully, um, to analyze. So click on this. I have a tar in here. I'll dig into it. We have a squashFS. It will not open the squashFS, so that's OK. I'll go ahead and take this root squashFS, and I'll move it over into my Ubuntu system. Once I have this file over in my Ubuntu system, I'm going to use unsquashFS to extract the squashFS file system. All right, so now that we have this, we have unsquash fest it, and everything just came right out. This is perfect. So what I can do now is go ahead and aim direct at it and just have it use all of its um, analyzers or signatures for specific files. So the way that we're going to do this is I'll call direct. It's already been NPM installed. Um, I'm going to point it to the location where that squashFS root file system came out. I'll tell it what signatures to load. It's going to go into signatures and load everything here. I'll give it a project name, which is just the name of this device where the PHP code base came from. And then I'll tell it what to output. And this is going to be the HTML file that we're going to review. Hit enter, and it runs pretty darn quick. There we go. We're done. So now I can head over to my direct scans open this up in a browser, and then we can start getting to work looking at POIs. What's really interesting about this is this sort of set a baseline very quickly. So your team, right? Let's say you have an internal, you're a pen tester, and the um, your team uh, audits PHP code a lot, or it audits ASP.NET or something. Um, what you can do is add your own signatures really easily to this. So for example, the PHP, um, uh, the PHP list didn't have sanitizing functions like escape shell command and escape shell arg, which I was really interesting in taking a look at because in older versions, uh, even newer versions, there's a way to bypass those. So I want to take a look at those types of things, right? By being able to fine tune this and build this to your specific project uh, is really nice. Let's say there's wrapper functions that wrap some interesting functionality. So you're only seeing system used once but then there's another function that just calls system. You can add that in real quick and then now all of a sudden regenerate in just a couple of seconds, all of your POIs to start looking for. So here's the system, here's the system. And in here, uh, it was actually truncate, okay. So we have truncate. This is inside of a comment. So truncate came back and found this. It's, it's not a call at all, but it takes no time at all for me to look at this and go, it's okay, 
right? I don't even need to note it because looking at this, anybody would know what the issue is, um, that it's just triggered on a comment. The question is, how can you exploit truncate? Why is truncate a bug? Why would I even want that? If you don't know what that is, it would be really cool to be able to educate your team at the same time with a little idea or like a confluence page or you know whatever internal documentation system you use to say, are you auditing PHP? If you are, here are the interesting things to look for. Did you find truncate in the code base? Here's how that could be exploited. So I think it would be beneficial in a future video to follow up to this one and talk about how we can actually create a parser from something like tree sitter or um, antler using a parser generator to create something that can actually give us a little bit more context behind these POIs. Not only can we look for these particular cases, but we can check to see whether or not comments are empty, right? Or what type of information is listed there. We can not only just look at that, but then we can look at it further to see if there's another string present in it. Or if we're looking at something that returns truncate, we can see whether or not that's actually uh, truncate or if it's just a string from a comment, right? So uh, this is something that can kind of help speed up the uh, effectiveness of your workflow by making sure that if you're looking at a POI, that there's some intelligence behind it. It's not just a string that's coming back. There's been more sort of like due diligence in the process of saying that this truncate is actually a call to truncate. It's not a variable name. It's not a string. It's not something else. And when you do find that, we can take a look at the parameters to it and try to see if they meet a minimum criteria. So that's sort of like the next step in this whole process is putting a little bit more intelligence behind your analysis using parsers and not using something like grep. But I think in just the you know short term, like this has really helped out my, my workflow. And I know that if I run this against all the code base that I'm looking for and I mark the things that I'm interested in, I'm going to be able to go step by step for my POIs and I'm going to be able to tell my team, here's what I looked at, here's what I found, here's what I tested, and here's what was useful out of this. So now that we've taken a look at that, I'd really like to know what your workflow is for auditing car large code bases. Uh, what happens when you approach a language that you're just not used to? What types of things are you doing to kind of help out that process? Let us know and share in the comments. Thanks. <laughs> share in the comments, smash like and subscribe. Yeah.